Hello? Got it. All right, so just in case this goes down, I want to try, I want to put another piece of technology to the test. I just tweeted a link to my slides, and as I flip through them, it will flip you through the slides. So if you don't see the link on Twitter, I, I tweeted it at Mountain West JS. The link to the slides is slides.com slash jdobry, that's J-D-O-B-R-Y, slash JS data slash uh, live, I believe. So, all right, I'm really happy to be here at Mountain West um, 2015 in particular because when I got the email about presenting, it said, we want you at Mountain West 2105, and I was like, wow. Uh, <laughs> I got put way in the backlog, um, so I just decided it was a typo and came, so here, um, hopefully that's okay. Um, a little bit about me, uh, my dad, I like soccer, I speak Russian, I play Dota 2, if you want to play with me, that'd be fun. That's my daughter, she's really cute. I just thought I'd put that up there, she's really cute. Um, I work at Lendio, it's a marketplace for small business loans. Um, full stack engineer, do lots of Node, lots of Angular, uh, MySQL PHP. Last five months I've been doing data science, um, so like machine learning, classification, statistical analysis stuff. It's pretty fun. Um, I'm really big into open source. I have a bunch of projects. Um, RethinkDB, I wrote an ORM for that, so shout out to them. Um, and then, today I'm talking about uh, one of my open source projects, um, JS Data. Um, I've given some other talks, and I have a side project, codetrain.io, you should check it out, it's pretty cool, because you guys are programmers and it's for you. So, why, why JS Data? Why am I gonna talk about a, a library today? Well, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the principles behind um, why it was built and why it's gonna help you. So, Merrick touched on this in his talk. He talked about the document web, which is kinda like web 1.0, where it's just static, it's just static. So, in, in that, in the, the old, in the old web, the document web, like Merritt termed it, you just have the browser and the view, and the user clicks links, and then the, the request is sent to the server, and the server receives the request, maybe pulls some data. If you've done like any like Java struts type work, you just get a, you just get a request, and then in your templates, you, you talk to your DAO layer, and then you get some data, and you just put it in your view, and then the HTML is sent back to the browser. Um, this, is how, this is how it was for a while, and the reason is that browsers were slow. They couldn't do a whole lot of work. Um, the CPU, uh, it takes CPU power to render, to render the templates in the client, and so browsers were slow, so server did a lot of the work. Um, also, you were limited on storage options. The only place where data was stored, really, was in your database, on your server. And uh, so, like, I mentioned the struts example. Um, in Web 2.0, uh, you saw the demand, we saw the demand for dynamic content, like the demand to be able to collaborate on the web. So we needed faster apps that could change quickly in response to user input. And in this paradigm, uh, we, we shift a lot of, of work to the browser. We shifted work for rendering templates and gathering data, organizing it in the, in the JavaScript. You got the JavaScript heavy apps. Merrick touched on that. Um, so in this, in, this, in this model, we saw the, also the emergence of REST. So you make requests for your data, you get the data back, and then it's rendered on the client. And this uh, happened because browsers got faster. CPUs on uh, all the users' devices got faster. So they could, you could actually offload, distribute the work to the clients. Also, we got more options for storage. Local storage, IndexedDB, the backend as a service that has emerged with like Firebase and Go Instant, uh, they may rest in peace, and other companies like that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this model layer right here that I've highlighted in orange. So you all use ORMs probably. Very likely at your company you've written your own. You've uh, spent a lot of time. In this room, it represents thousands and thousands of man hours and millions of dollars worth of cost. Um, the amount of time we spent writing these model layers, not just in the back end, but now in the front end as well. And if you, if you use like frameworks like Angular, you realize that they don't really, it doesn't ship with a model layer. You build one yourself. 
Many blog posts and talks have been dedicated to how to write a model layer in Angular, um, how to use services, and the same kind of problems apply in many frameworks. And there are very, very many frameworks. They all, slight, they all solve kind of the similar problem in slightly different ways. Um, but the model layer has never been super consistent among these many frameworks. I'm sure someone in this room has used all of these different frameworks. Though some of the frameworks try and address the model layer. Some are just libraries that are for the view only. Um, but there's no real consistency there. So every time you switch from framework to framework to framework, you're rewriting your model layer to some degree. And I'm sure we've all done that. And it takes a lot of work. JS data enters the picture as a consistent data layer that you can take with you um, for, as you move from framework to framework. It's framework agnostic. And it solves this problem that tens of thousands of developers dedicate their time to solving every day. Um, JS data works um, as an in-memory client or an in-memory data store. It runs on the browser and on Node.js. And then it uses adapters to do the asynchronous communication to your various persistence layers. Each adapter abstracts away from the data store how to get the data. So in the browser, um, you have a data store. Um, and then it can, it can communicate with your REST backend. It can communicate to local storage, to local forage, Mozilla's project, to Firebase. And it presents you with the same API, regardless of which persistence layer you're using for your data. And you can use multiple persistence layers in combination. So if you wanted to build like an offline app, where you can optionally be saving data to local storage, and then when it's online again, sync that back to your, your backend store. On the back end, I currently I have adapters for a number of SQL databases, MongoDB, RethinkDB, and then the HTTP and Firebase adapters, they work on Node as well. So uh, the result of this project has been um, a nice, nice documentation built on readme.io, which I highly recommend to anybody. And I built a GitHub organization where I can organize these, it's like a dozen projects so far. And I'm really open to collaboration and building a sort of the Twitter bootstrap of data layers for, for client-side code and back-end code. It can work in as an, an ORM on your front end and your back end. Uh, there's a term like isomorphic code. You could, if you're using Node.js on the back end, you could theoretically use, write your model code once and then reuse it on the back end and the front end with this using JS data on the front end and the back end. So, the philosophy is driving uh, JS data. I originally wrote a project called Angular Data because using Angular at work, we didn't have a model layer. We read blog posts, we're like, okay, we got these controllers, we're not supposed to do HTTP calls in our controllers, we're supposed to write these services. So we started writing services. We have like 30 different resources in our database and writing services got tedious. So what we did is we used decomposition and we were dry and so we wrote code that could be reused, like a base service, and then we would re reuse it for all of our different resources and then that grew into the inspiration for Angular Data, which I wrote during ng-conf last year. And then on Hacker News, someone made a comment when, when it was submitted. They said, why is this an Angular library? So I ripped out Angular, and I created JS Data and this organization to make the framework agnostic um, tool that can be used whether you're using Angular or React. And in fact, I have two demos that demo the same thing. One uses Angular, one uses React, and they both use JS data for all their, their persistence needs. So um, you may have seen tools like Breeze, JS, and there are some other like Angular tools like REST Angular, NG Resource. They all solve the problem to, to various degrees. My experience with Breeze is that it was extremely complex. And after a day working on it, I had no real, nothing to show for it as far as integrating it into our product. I needed something that was easy, but I needed something that did more than like ng resource, something that actually stores data in the browser and can abstract away multiple persistence layers. So the goal with J JS Data is for it to be easy to use. You can just install it and immediately be making requests and pulling data for your various resources. Um, the a API is rec recognizable. It's similar to what you would see in like Mongo, Mongo's client, or Mongoose, or various ORMs, the way they try and pull data. 
Your apps yet, might not yet be Frankenstein apps, like Merrick was saying, but most of your apps are probably CRUD, uh, meaning that they uh, do create, read, update, delete operations on a bunch of different resources. Um, it's the kind of thing that we don't need to keep reinventing the wheel for. It's been reinvented so many times that let's just come up with uh, something that's reusable that saves you those, that boilerplate code and the time rewriting it and resolving the problem every time you go to a new company. And uh, that's what this dead simple CRUD and reusable code is for. Framework agnostic, switch from Angular to React or React to Angular. You don't have to rewrite your model layer. You just keep it. Storage agnostic, the adapters can abstract away um, from the memory store the, the differences in retrieving data from different sources. Um, I tried to pick conventions that would generalize the solution to the problem for the, as many use cases as possible, but then left it open for you to configure it for the, the various idiosyncrasies of your REST backend, because various people, they'll have like a .json at the end of their URL, or they'll have nested nested resources in the URL, so they want to change the base path and things like that. So it, there's a convention that is, um, I tried to make it the, the most default, uh, applies to as many people as possible convention, and then a configuration so you can extend it, uh, tweak it to your needs. And then the tool itself tries to help you not shoot yourself in the foot. So if you do something wrong, the API is uh, helpful with its error messages and things like that. So it expects you to provide the right arguments, and this principle of design by contract, that's what it follows in the implementation. Now the store and the adapters, each are separate projects. Um, and here's an example of how to do it. So you can simply new up a new store once you've loaded JS data in your app, and that creates in memory a store, just a data store. And then uh, you, what you do is you register adapters with the store. For example, you register the HTTP adapter, and you tell it to use it as default. So by default, when you do any async operation, find, find all, or create, it's going to default to using your HTTP adapter, which will communicate with your REST backend. Uh, here's an example of registering a Firebase adapter. And uh, in every method call, you can also override the default and just say, for this particular method call, I actually want you to go to Firebase and pull the data from there, or something like that. So, uh, once you have your memory store, you, you gotta tell your memory store about your resources. So you just call store, define resource, give it a name, and then that is the only required option for a resource. It will assume a whole bunch of default options um, from that, and then there's lots of configuration. This school resource is an example of a relation that shows a relation, so like school belongs to district. So you can do relations and it will automatically link up your objects together so they just have references to, the, uh, to each other as you need them. There's an example of the default settings. The store comes with default settings and then the, dis uh, the resources inherit from the default settings, but every setting is overridable on the resource level and even on the method call level. So I defined a district and a school resource, uh, two resources by default, it's going to assume that ID is your primary key that you're using to identify unique items. You can customize that. With Mongo, it's going to be underscore ID, probably. So you're going to have to configure that. Um, for If you're going to use the HTTP adapter, it assumes a certain format for your, your endpoints, um, slash district on the get. You can customize all of that and configure it to your needs. Maybe you use it's districts instead of district. You, maybe you chose plural and you're in that camp or something. And all that can be customized. So the API for the data store, it gives you a synchronous API and an async API. The synchronous allows you to interact with data that's already in the store. So if you want to just synchronously pull some data and you don't want to, you don't want to have to deal with a promise or waiting or latency or have anything like that, you can just you can query the data store itself for what it already has. This is what's in memory in the browser or in Node. So here's an example of a synchronous get call. Um, district.get id of one it's undefined right now because there's nothing in the store the store is empty so the store returns undefined now with the find call that is the asynchronous analog to get get and find are like the same thing one is synchronous queries the data store one is asynchronous and it will de delegate to an adapter 
So I call find, and it's going to delegate to the, def to the HTTP adapter, which was the default, performs a get request. The find call immediately returns you a promise, a promise which represents the eventual value that your server will return. So when the server resolves, it returns some JSON. That, um, the district ID 1 gets injected into the store, and then it resolves your promise with that data. Um, so right here, um, you can see that it, it resolves the promise with your data, but then I can call that synchronous get call, and it returns me that same object already in the data store, and that strict equals shows you that they are the, they are the same object. It is a reference to the same object that's in the store. Um, JS data uses something called identity mapping, meaning it doesn't throw away data. Um, if an item is already in the store and you re-retrieve it from the, from the back end, the reference you had to the original, original item will stay valid. It will just update the one that's already in the store with what you retrieve from the back end. So it keeps a single unique copy of every unique item that you ever put into the data store, and then any reference you get to that item will stay valid. It's not going to get invalidated. It's not going to throw data away. So it conserves data from that point of view. So if I call find again, there isn't actually going to be another get request because that item is already in the store. All of this is configurable. You can force it to make a new request, but it gives you caching out of the box. You, don't, you can call find as many times as you want. The first time, it'll make a get request, and subsequent times, it'll just use the promise and resolve with the data if it's already there. Here's another example that shows some things like saving data. Now that my district is already in the store, I can, use, I can, I can just mutate the data, district.name, set it to wasatch, and then I can uh, call save. That's going to do a put. I get the promise back. It resolves with the result of the call. And I can see that my district has been updated. It has, it's, re, it's synced. When you do asynchronous oper operations, it delegates to adapters and then syncs the results of those calls back to the data store. So your data store will reflect the results of anything you do asynchronously. Here's an example of destroying the district. And at the very end, oops. I call that, I do that synchronous get call again after the destroy call has resolved and the data is gone. It's no longer in the data store. So here's a, here's a quick table of kind of some synchronous methods and their analogs. Filter, um, JS data comes with a query syntax. You can query the in-memory data store um, using like a where type statement, where criteria. You can use, you can sort, you can, you can limit, you can offset and things like that. So it makes doing pagination and like infinite scrolling really nice because you can you just query the in-memory data store for a collection according to some filter criteria that your UI defines. And then on the side, you're querying your server for that data. And then when the server responds, you can have your view just automatically re-pull from the in-memory data store whatever according to whatever criteria you need. Uh, a couple demos. So here's just a really simple demo that shows using uh, Angular and JS data. This one's using the Firebase adapter. Can you, is that, oh, wrong screen, sorry. Can everybody see that big enough? So and if you're familiar with an Angular app, at the very beginning in the config phase, I set up my Firebase adapter. I tell it where my Firebase is, give it a URL. Then down here, I, register, I register my Firebase adapter as the default. I use a factory or service or whatever to create my user resource, and then I return it so I can inject my user resource wherever I need it in the app. And then down below in my controller, I finally make an initial request for the users. It'll make a, it'll request, it'll get all the users from Firebase. And then this bind all call right here, what that says is whenever the user collection changes, update the users field on the scope with those users. So it'll just keep them synced to your scope. And then a couple methods for adding and destroying users. So with an example, I can just say, add a new user, and I'm added. And 
you can see that it just automatically updated the ngrp, the list, with the user that I added after the, the store completed its operation. Sorry, this was the, uh, yeah, that's the Angular example. Now I can show you the React example, which I wrote last night, so it was the first time I've ever used uh, React, so take all this code with a grain of salt. I don't know if it's the right way to do it. But it seems to work. So if I refresh this React page, um, people have been playing with it. So, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, if, you, if you're using like WebSockets and, and things like that, you could implement a sort of three-way data binding, which like was, I guess, coined by Firebase, but you could have, if you had multiple clients and you use those WebSockets to broadcast that certain data had been updated or created, and then you could have your various clients then just pull in the new data, you could have uh, the new users be appearing here automatically and things like that, automatically re-rendered. So with, with the React app, and once again, I don't know if I did this right, I took the, the to-do to the, the to list example from the Flux architecture page, and I replaced all of the dispatcher and store code with just a simple JS data resource and just plugged it in, and it appears to work. So there's this on change stuff where I say whenever the, the on change, I register, okay, user store on change, whenever there's a change in the store, whenever the user list changes, call that React on change, which changes the state, which I guess tells the re React to re-render. That's how it works, I think. And uh, yeah, you can look at that. So those are two really, really tiny examples. Normally, you're going to have a much bigger app, many resources, many routes. It's very convenient to be able to just define your resources like this, define your relationships among them. You can do a, a find request where it retrieves like maybe nested relations. And when they all get pulled into the browser, the data store will automatically inject all of those pieces into the right place in the data store and then link them up together so you have the right links to, to them and things like that. Um, I've created a repo, JS data examples, if I go back to the slides. And uh, that's a link, these slides, these are links. So that's going to be an example of applications using various back ends combined with various front ends that all use JS data and they will hopefully showcase different things like um, with different ways of using relations, different features, offline, online type things. Um, right now, the only examples I have in there is a, a, a rethink DB backend. So JS data runs on Node as well. So it just uses a rethink DB adapter, and then it can just it's like an out of the box ORM for rethink DB. And on the, on the only front end example I have is a, an Angular one, and uh, it's kind of like this demo I showed here. So I'm just going to do a quick run through on some of the features. I tried to combine some of the best of the best that I found in various data layer frameworks out there. Um, a lot of this was inspired actually by Ember Data. I really kind of appreciated um, some of the, the problem they were trying to solve. It's just, it's tied to Ember and your server really has to meet a strict format on how it does its URLs and requests and I really didn't like that so that's why I wanted to make this as configurable as possible. Um, one is model lifecycle hooks. So whenever you do like a, an update, there's going to be a before validate, a validate, after validate, before update, and then it's going to actually update and persist it to your, your, your persistence layer, and then an after update. And at any point in that operation, you can abort the life cycle, you can modify data, it just gives you complete control and you can get your fingers in things. Um, relations, as many belongs to, there are a couple methods that help with linking things together or dynamically, like I guess you call it maybe side loading relations on the fly. After you define your resources, you can add your own static methods to your classes um, that are like these global class level methods. Um, there's also an actions option where you can, it really only applies to the HTTP adapter, but if you have like your user resource, but then you want to get, you have like this thing where you att append count to the URL and it gives you the count instead of the actual data, like you can just use the op actions option to do things like that. Um, one thing I really liked about Angular is how you put your data on the scope, but it can just be a plain POJO. It doesn't have to be wrapped in any sort of constructor. It doesn't have to be any heavy model class or anything like that. So you could potentially use JS data and have your data be pure POJO. JS data will maintain metadata about your stuff, but it's, it doesn't have to decorate your data with these constructor classes if you don't want it to. And that can improve performance. 
But if you're going to use the, the wrapper constructor that it provides, then you can add your own custom instance methods. So they'll just be put on the prototype, and then they'll be, they'll be available on any instances you inject into the store. For example, uh, I added one called say. It just returns this dot name. And once you create an instance, you can call user, user dot say. And that's an instance method. You can do that kind of stuff. So some people like to just work with POJOs, and then they have services that will operate on things and do their methods for them. Other people like to wrap their data with um, constructors and then attach logic to the instances themselves. It's uh, kind of a style that different people prefer. Uh, another one is these con convenient shorthands. Um, if you are using Angular, you can use dependency injection to pass around the various resources in the places that they're needed. Or you can just pass around a reference to the, just the store. And then when you're doing your operations, you just tell what resource you want it to operate on. Some of these methods are also proxied through to those instances. So you only would need to have a reference to the instance itself, and you could tell the instance to save itself. And it really just has the store save the instance. So whatever style you prefer. Computed properties. JS data relies on object.observe and the observe.js polyfill, in case the browser doesn't support it, to detect changes to, to your data. And it will automatically recompute computed properties whenever your data changes and things like that. You can see that after I inject this user, the full name property has been computed um, for you. Um, so that's pretty cool. Part of the metadata that um, JS data tracks about your items is the la the, a timestamp of the last time your data changed. So in an, in, if you're using an Angular app, you could set up like a watch where you just watch that timestamp and whenever it changes, um, that means your data, like you need to like go re-render something or re-run some code. It's, it's different than the dirty checking, which can be a, a kind of a performance hit because it uses object observe. And it will only update that number, that time span, according to object observes um, watching. So it can be more perf uh, performant. Uh, I, already, I already talked about querying collections. Um, there's also a library, JS Data Schema, which allows you to dis define uh, a schema for a resource. Uh, required attributes, maximum length, different things like that. And then you can have it on save and update, validate those schemas. So you can get kind of out of the box client side validation of your data. The change de detection I talked about. Um, some of these features come with a performance hit if you're going to. Uh, be some, doing some of these things. They can all be disabled to improve performance for certain resources if you don't care about this kind of thing for them. Uh, one of the features is change track, tracking. You can actually get like a, a, a log of the changes that have happened to each of your items. Um, that's off by default because it can affect the performance. But you can query your items to say, does my item have any changes? What are the changes? What were the previous values of this item before it was changed? You can query all those things with your data. Also, some built-in cache expiration capabilities. So you could do something like say, I'm going to load a bunch of like comments into this into the data store, but I only want them to last like 15 minutes because people are flipping around comments so often, and they're not they're not going to go back to them really. They might, so that's maybe why I should cache it. But after 15 minutes, you know, just kick them out of the store. Just kick them back out so I can just kind of not bog down the the heap with uh, objects. And yeah, so the goal here is to turn this into the Twitter bootstrap of data layers for JavaScript apps. So uh, that's JS Data. Thanks.